Hey CCF, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we just wanted to do a, a quick kind of devotional series uh, every Thursday night here for a little while. And uh, we figured it would be cool if uh, each minister that does a devotion just kind of shares with you guys something that we've been studying ourselves. And so uh, I wanted to jump in and I wanted to share with you guys something that God has been teaching me throughout this season. And, uh, and one thing that I think cannot be ignored about this season is that uh, it, it's a season that is filled with fear, confusion, worry, dread, and even sometimes panic, right? And amidst all this, I, I think uh, some of you guys can, can probably relate with me, and especially in the beginning, I felt like I was really on like a roller coaster of emotions. Um, there were times when I felt very positive and I felt like we were going to make it through the coronavirus and, you know, we'd be okay. Um, and then there were really times where I felt like, you know, it was worst case scenario and that, you know, everything was, was going in the worst uh, worst direction possible. I had feelings of, of dread and worry and, and uncertainty and even anxiety. Um, but one of the things that I truly believe about God is that he is teaching us, he's molding us, he's using the experiences around us to help us to become more like Jesus. And he's teaching us through even the most uncertain times in our lives. And I really do believe that uh, where Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And so I think that uh, we should always be looking for ways that God may be teaching us, even during tough times, even during good times. Uh, but we should be looking for ways that God might be trying to, to, to shape us, trying to teach us something about him. And so I wanted to share with you guys one thing that has been really relevant to me, and one thing that I've, I feel like God has really been placing on my heart. And I want to go to the book of Esther to show you what that is. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, feel free to go ahead and turn there um, to the book of Esther. Uh, but uh, a quick intro about Esther. Um, it's actually kind of a strange book in terms of scripture. And uh, one of the reasons it's strange is because God is literally not even mentioned once. Um, which is pretty strange when it comes to scripture that God is uh, never even mentioned, um, which is almost concerning at first, but it actually, upon a kind of a further examination, it packs a really relevant punch for us today. Um, because when we look at uh, the story of Esther, we see that uh, she was a lot like us um, and her story and her journey of faith was a lot like ours. You know, in this age of Christendom, we don't always hear God's audible voice. Um, we don't have a pillar of fire and, and a cloud to, to you know, carry us and, and show us through the desert. We don't have prophets and apostles giving us literally God's word, you know, outside of actual scripture, of course. Um, and so uh, sometimes we actually feel like Esther, where we have actually kind of the same thing that she had. We have some of God's word. We have faithful men and women around us. And then most importantly, we have hope in a very real and active God who is working for the good of those who love him. And that's really what I want to focus on here in the book of Esther is, is, is the, the hope that we have in a real and active God, even when we don't have that audible direction from God or that, that, that really obvious, you know, God is moving right now. Um, but we still have that hope in God. And, and I want to focus on that and I want to hone into um, Mordecai um, and, and his, uh, it's Esther's uh, cousin who raised her as a child. Um, but it, I want to hone in on his kind of influence in Esther's life for this. So the beginning of the story Esther, of Esther starts out with kind of a dicey little intro in which the Babylonian king decides that he wants a newer, more beautiful, younger bride. Um, surprise, surprise. And that's where we see Esther enter into the story. Now, Esther was essentially an orphan who was raised by her older cousin, Mordecai. And we see in chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, that um, it actually says that Mordecai was carried away during the Babylonian captivity. But it doesn't mention that Esther was. Um, but it does say that her parents died. So we can assume that Mordecai is quite a bit older. Um, and, and he raises her kind of as his own daughter. Um, but anyways, Esther kind of finds herself in the middle of this bachelor uh, Babylonian edition. And uh, the king sends out officials to bring back the most beautiful women in the entire kingdom. And when they come to uh, Mordecai's uh, hometown in Esther's town, they see Esther and they take her to be on the new reality TV show to see who's going to you know, vie for the king's, uh, uh, for the queen role. And uh, uh, before she left, M Mordecai actually tells Esther not to reveal that she was of Jewish descent. And so she did not. And as we go through the book here, we're just going to kind of read some snapshots to get like the, the story here. So I want to read ch chapter 2, verses uh, 10 and 11. It says, Esther had not made known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. 
Now, um, obviously Mordecai had a reason for telling her, don't reveal you know, your, your, your heritage, don't reveal that you're a Jew, and we'll see why shortly. Um, and we fast forward a little while in the story. A few, few other things happen that, that we're not covering, but fast forward a little bit, and we see that Esther essentially gets the final rose. Um, the bachelor chooses her, and she becomes the queen. The king is happy. He actually reduces taxes. Who doesn't like that? He gives out gifts. It's like a huge party, and everything is good. Enter Haman. Now, Haman is a bad dude. He is the main bad guy in this story. And the more you read Esther, the more you hate him. He is just a sneaky little dude, a weasel of a man, a pea-brained, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder, warthog-faced buffoon, little Hitler man. Now, none of those things are actually specifically mentioned in the text, but it's fairly obvious. And in fact, he actually did have the same idea as Hitler far before Hitler came around. Kill all the Jews. So uh, Haman actually devises a plan and sort of tricks the king, but he's kind of complicit, but he doesn't really know, but tricks the king into signing into a law, a decree that will literally evaporate, evaporate every single Jew on the face of the planet. And if we read uh, chapter 3, verses 13 through, uh, verses 13, we'll see here just a quick snapshot. It says, uh, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young, old women and children in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Now, you gotta admit, this is a pretty good plan. I mean, it was literally like the purge with a purpose. And that rhymes way too well. I don't like it, but we're gonna move on. But basically, they set a day where all the Jews were set to be annihilated. They set a day where it was like, literally everyone, your neighbors, I mean, if your neighbor was a Jew, you could go and you could kill them and you could steal their stuff. And so it was really good plan, and, it, it, and, and Haman set it into motion, the king signed it, and it literally says after that, a couple verses later, um, it says, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. And so, you know, all the Jews know that there's literally an expiration date on their lives, and Haman is out to the bar with the king, and uh, ha having a good time, very pleased with himself. And, you know, this is where we get to kind of the anxiety-ridden, the worry, the fear, um, the, the panic of the story. Now, obviously, you know, the whole coronavirus thing is, is not nearly to this level. You know, we don't have a detonation date for our lives. Um, but we, you know, it's the same worries and fears and emotions, just to a much higher degree. And so we can acknowledge that. Um, but this is where we kind of get to the conversation of Mordecai and the now Queen Esther. Side note about Queen Esther, shout out to my sister Hannah. When we were kids, we had a guinea pig and she named it Queen Esther because we loved veggie tales. Um, veggie Tales for all of you public schoolers out there is a Christian show where veggies um, do things that are good for Jesus. Um, but she named her uh, her guinea pig named Queen Esther, so I really forever cannot say the words Queen Esther without thinking of that weird little animal. Um, a moment of silence for Queen Esther. May she rest in peace. And we're back. So chapter four, Mordecai learns of what's happened and he goes into mourning. So he knows that, you know, the destruction is coming. He goes sackcloth and ashes, the whole bit, you know, ancient world style. And Esther's servants find out and they go to talk to him to see what's up. And that's where we kind of jump back into the story in chapter four, verse six. So it says, Hathach went, went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he may show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except to the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king for these 30 days. So basically Mordecai fills Esther in on like the DL of the situation. He asked her to go in to plead with the king, obviously like use, you know, the, the reputation, the, the, the collateral essentially that you have as the queen and, and, and go and beg for the king on behalf of her people. To which Esther responds with the fact that she'll be killed if she goes to the king uninvited. In church words, it's kind of a darned if you do, darned if you don't situation here going on. Um, 
And then we kind of jump into verses uh, 12 through 14, which are uh, potentially some of the most famous, uh, famous verses in the book of Esther, and for good reason. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so these are kind of the infamous words of Mordecai that really give Esther the, the, the courage and the hope of something greater that, that gives her what she needs to act. And so Esther, you know, goes in and she, she commands the Jews to all go into a, a time of fasting and she starts to kind of develop a plan. And, and we fast through it forward through the rest of the story. And e Esther kind of enters into like ultimate stealth mode. And she like prepares these feasts for the king and Haman. She woos them both. And, and they're like, oh, we'll give you whatever you want. And she's like, all right, yeah, just come on back for another feast. I'll, you know, I'll treat you again. And she they, gives them everything that they want. And they're like, oh, well, you know, any wish is, is our command. And she's like, come back for another feast. And so she like woos them all. all, all and, and, and then all of a sudden, um, at, the, at the very last feast, she turns on Haman. She exposes him. And essentially he hangs on a gallow that is about twice as tall as the men's Christian campus house, um, which is basically the ancient world's version of a status update that says the Jewish people are saved. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the snapshot of the story of Esther. And, and God certainly worked in some major ways, even though he wasn't speaking directly, even though there wasn't a pillar of fire, even though Jesus wasn't right there walking with the people. Um, but, but God was working. And, and, and I think the catalyst for all of this hope um, that Mordecai instilled in Esther. And I think that that was the catalyst for for Esther to move forward and to be able to have the courage to really develop a very sneaky plan um, and, and, and really put her life on the line. Of course, she was going to die either way, but um, she might have been able to hide out for a while. You know, she probably had a lot of excuses that she could have made. Um, but it was the hope that Mordecai gave her that gave her the courage to act. You know, he said, hey, look, you know, God's going to save the Jews regardless, right? So he's telling her God is real. God is active. God has a plan for his people. And then he's also telling her, look, maybe God brought you to this place for this time, for this moment, so that you could do something right here. And, you know, uh, when we talk about hope, um, sometimes in, in our English language, we, we use hope in essentially the wrong way or in a weird way. We use hope as simply a, a desire or um, a wishful thought. Like, oh, I, I really hope that Taco Bell gives out free tacos on Tuesday next week again because they've been doing that for a while. If you haven't taken advantage of it, you should look it up and see if your local Taco Bell does it. But biblical usage of hope is far deeper than that. It's really, it's not just the desire that something good would happen, but it's the desire that something good would happen and the expectation that it will. And that expectation comes from from something deeper. And, and biblical hope can have this, this expectation and this power because it is based in something. Um, it, it's like when we say that we have hope in uh, an eternal life through Christ, it's not that we just hope that we have a life that's better when we pass on. It's that we actually have hope in eternal life because Jesus, who is God, was born a man, lived a life, worked on this earth, died, was buried and resurrected. We know that that happened. So our hope isn't just a wishful thought. It's based in something that happened. It's based in fact. It's based in truth. It's based in who God is. And the reason I think that this biblical hope is so important is because I, I think that this message of hope is really relevant to us right now because we've got a lot of people, myself and, and maybe some of you guys that are, that are uh, anxious or worried or scared or just uncertain or things are changing it rapidly and you don't know how to keep up with it. Uh, maybe you're even panicked by what's going on around you. And I, I want to encourage all of you to consider how you can be a messenger of hope, not just wishful thinking, but true biblical hope. How can you be a Mordecai in someone else's life? And, and, and the reason I think this is so important is because it's not just wishful thinking. It's, it's real biblical hope that encourages the brokenhearted, that God is in control. And it's not just because we want him to be in control, but it's because we know that he's in control. We know that he, he has a plan for his people. We know that he loves us. We know that, that there's the work of Jesus Christ and we have security in that. And that we have freedom from, frankly, the overwhelming emotions in life. And it's not because we're, you know, this biblical hope, it doesn't make us like 
above the emotions of life or above the, the effects of life in like a weird spiritual transcendent way or anything like that. It, it is simply because we know God lives and that he is working and that he loves us. And that's what gives us the hope of knowing that there's something bigger, knowing that God has a plan. Not just saying, you know, we're going to meditate and, 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 and get away from this or something. It's because we know that God is real. We know that he is active. And that's what gives us the hope to, to be above like the overwhelming emotions of this life and the overwhelming uh, times that we're in right now. You see, the power of God is what gives us our hope. And that's what Esther learned in this story. And that's what gave her the courage to act. That's what Mordecai knew. And that's what gave him the courage to, to uh, give Esther that same hope. And I think that that's the same hope that we need to have and that it's times like this, it's times of uncertainty where that hope is a light and it's a beacon to our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure to, uh, to check our YouTube ch channel because our awesome worship team is going to be uploading a, 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 a video worship uh, live next Thursday night. And so that's going to be super cool. Make sure to uh, tune in for that. But thanks for doing this devotion with, with us here. And uh, always remember that Queen Esther is way cooler than you. And I'll let you decide if I'm talking about the pig or not.